know your name, I know you great Yeah, 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 yeah. Control my life, so I put my trust in you. You control my life, I put my trust in you. I know your name, I know your grain. Bad vibes can't even come my way. I'm just tryna serve, God, bring that place. Back in the days, couldn't find my way, but I know you got me. Ain't no love like you and me. So I was blind, but now I see. Why got all this face on me? And for, for that reason, you uh, have no desire to, to share. God's glorious word to, to others. I really hope that as we see people getting baptized this morning, we will see the urgency and the need to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To see that this is why we're here. Our resources, our finances, our prayers, our energy should be all catered towards the Great Commission. So maybe this morning you want to ask the Lord to, to help you fulfill this mission with his church. This is not just one commission for one person, it's a commission for the whole church. And maybe you wanna pray, Lord, we wanna see more baptisms. We wanna be able to baptize more people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we wanna be part of teaching people everything that Jesus has commanded. We know that we live in a world where every single living soul needs to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have this fantastic privilege where Jesus has called all of us to himself. And so we have a good news to share. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love and your grace towards us that we woke up again by your grace. And we thank you this morning that we can come here freely to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. We've come here to hear your word preached. And we're here also, Lord, to fulfill your great commission, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I pray that today will be a time for us to be challenged, to be encouraged, A time for us to repent of our sins. And a time for us to know you in a deeper way, Lord. So God, we give you this service. We ask that you would increase and we will decrease. That you will be glorified in every aspect of our service this day. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to the worship team. They're going to lead us in sang worship. Thank you.
Amen. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for your blood that gives us life, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have been so gracious and so loving towards every single human being, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that we would uh, come to the full understanding of who you are, Lord. In your name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's fellowship for a few moments. Let's uh, turn to your neighbor or get out your seats and go and see someone you haven't seen before. But let's just encourage people for a few moments. Thank you. It's great to fellowship, but we've got a service to continue. So let's get to our seats so we can continue. So church family, I just have a couple of notices uh, for you. Again, hands up if you were at our last theology night. Awesome. I hope that you had a fruitful time. Theology night is always very interesting. Some interesting debates. It's actually a time where we can actually debate as Christians and still love each other-ish, depending on, <laughs> depending on, yeah, we'll see. But we, we have our next theology night, and this theology night is how does God communicate to us? Now, for some people here, it, it, it might be a very simple response to that. Um, but I, I've recognized in my time in ministry that a lot of people believe that God speaks to us in many, 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 many different ways. And so to, to, in this session, we're going to really assess how does God communicate to his people? We know that God is a relational God, and we know that he is speaking but how is he speaking? How is he God really speaking? And I think it's a very important question to ask ourselves because we want to hear God. Amen? We, we want to hear God so that we can obey him and do whatever God has called us uh, to do. So we're, um, I want to really encourage you, if you want to know how God communicates to us today, come to this session. It's on the 31st of May at 7.30 sharp because normally uh, people are walking in around 8 o'clock. But 7.30 sharp, and we're going to discuss this session. There will be a Zoom link as well, so if you get the newsletter, um, um, you will get the Zoom link if you're not physically able to, to be there. But I want to encourage you, if you can physically be there, uh, let's be there so we can uh, dialogue together. Uh, we have our church AGM, so our annual general meeting, and our church members meeting on Sunday, the 9th of June. I believe some of the paperwork of the minutes of the previous meetings are at the back of the church, so if you please um, could get a copy of that to read for it, and I will hope to start quite promptly. We are going to have a church lunch afterwards, uh, and we want to suggest that um, if people are able to give donations towards this lunch, that will be much appreciated, but if you can't, uh, we totally understand. So that's the 9th of June. And just want to remind our young people, you um, should have heard from this from uh, Anik already, but we do have a youth camp that we're going to. I don't think we have the slides for that. Um, with um, LCM, we have a very uh, amazing, um, great camp that we're going to uh, from the 30th, I believe, of July to the 5th of August. Is that right? Yeah, that's about right. And so um, if you're able to come, please do come. The charges are £75. Um, but parents, if you are struggling uh, to pay that, please do come and speak to me. Again, it's an opportunity for you to have some free time. Your children are away. You can relax. But also, it's a time for God to really work through our young people. There's something quite special when young people go away from their normal environment and, and get just days of God's word imparted into them. So really hope that you can be there for that. Awesome. That's that for the notices. And I have Sister Patience that has a testimony. Share out. Jogging for the day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise Jesus. Amen. Glory be to God. My pastor, uh, Pastor Denzel, uh, spoke my heartbeat this morning as he began to speak about the Great Commission and the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse, from verse 18 to 20. Uh, this is what we are here for. Praise the living Jesus. In the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from 18 to 20, it says that we are reconciled. Jesus reconciled us to himself, you know, and we are called to, be, to reconcile others to God. And he called us ambassadors, ambassadors of heaven. What is an ambassador? I won't go into much detail. We are an ambassador of heaven 
to represent heaven. Everything that God, you know, expects us to do, we are to be doing it. You know, so that is our job description. We are reconciled to reconcile others. As our pastor said, we are not here to sit in the church and fill the pews. There are people dying out there and going to hell. Or they cannot hear unless we speak. They cannot hear. So our assignment as ambassadors is to go out there where the fishes are and bring them in and fill the pews of the church so that they can in turn go and reconcile others to God. Praise the living Jesus. My testimony is, last month, some of you know what I do. Um, I represent an organization, a network called Kiwi, Kingdom Impact Vision International. Uh, we have about 900 people on the platform. I coordinate, I'm the coordinator of United Kingdom. We travel a lot. Last month, we traveled to Slough, and about 85 of us, and 191 souls made commitment to the Lord. You know, the city of Slough will never be the same again. Yes, you can praise. Feel free to give God the glory. You know, and that was last month. Yesterday, we left very early. Uh, we went to Cochester. We've been doing this for years, and Cochester felt like a very stronghold area. I even had an email warning me that we are going to face a lot of opposition. But before we go out to these cities, we spend a week you know, sometimes over a week, praying and fasting 24-7. You come online, 1 o'clock in the morning, 3 a.m., 5 a.m., there are people traveling over the situation. We cannot go and face the strong man without first binding the strong man. So we're constantly waiting on the Lord, trusting God. I say this with all reverence to God. It's not an easy task. As we do this, it's like your life is on the line. Be ready. To, to pay the cost. And I got email warning me that we're going to face all sorts of opposition. I did not tell the team. I kept that email to myself. I didn't even tell the visioneer. Uh, I just told them, keep praying, keep praying. When we got there, it was a battle. But you know what? When God sends you an assignment, he goes ahead of you. He backs you up. You can afford to depend on him. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. We arrived there. The security was saying, no, no music, no this, no that. But we just obeyed and just let God be God. And I tell you, within 30 minutes of us arriving in that city, the spiritual atmosphere changed. And God began to move as we, you know, began to evangelize. I tell you, young people, I've got videos. We, we come with videos, pictures. Young people, regardless of what race, gender, everybody was just joining us. The security was amazed. The people that were telling us no. When they saw the joy and the praises of God that has filled the city, they had to, even the security joined us. Young people were giving their life to Christ like no man's business. We ended up with 176 souls made commitment to the Lord. This was hard ground, but God's name was glorified. <laughs> Hallelujah. My last testimony, and I have to go. The last testimony was we jumped on the coach. The coach was 53 seater full of us, and some people drive. As I was on the coach, we have a number, 0330 something for Kiwi. And anyone that calls that number, it rings on my phone because I'm the coordinator of UK. I saw this missed call, so I called the number back, only to find out that a grandmother in Peckham called me. You know, when I called her back, she said, I'm from Peckham. I just heard from my grandchild in tears and expressing the impact that came upon her in Cochester. From Cochester, a young child was now preaching to the grandmother in Peckham. The grandmother said, please, can you call me? I want to, she said, I must connect with this Jesus. He brings peace and joy. You must connect with God. And the grandmother was crying, said, please call me. I want to give my life to Jesus. You know, isn't that God? He said, I want to be baptized. Just hearing from the child. 
from her own grandchild. This is amazing. This is God. You know, uh, that's all I will say. Let's just give God thanks. God is worthy to be praised. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Sister Patience. And I'm always just reminded of, as we read this morning, of, of the Great Commission. And I, I believe God is stirring people's hearts to evangelize. And maybe you don't know how or, or um, don't know when, um, please do come and uh, speak to, to me after the service. Um, there are people in different groups. Um, I know uh, Reese and some others were in Lewisham yesterday. Yeah, Lewisham. And so we're, we're, yeah, we're just trying to share the gospel in any way that we can. So if you uh, feel that the Lord is really stirring your heart and encouraging you to, to come and share the gospel in some way, please uh, come and speak uh, to me. Awesome. I'm going to invite our amazing children to go to your classes. And I hope that you have a great time learning about Jesus. Um, let's pray for them as they go. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, I'm always reminded of you calling the little children to yourself, Lord. And uh, we know that you don't just call the, just the matured in age, Lord, but you, you call all people to yourself, even children. And I just pray for our Sunday school teachers. I pray, Lord, that you help them teach your glorious word in a fun, relevant, but firm way, Lord. Um, and help the parents in this room to continue to disciple their children throughout the week. Uh, but be with them as they go to their classes. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, DJ. Thank you. I'm going to invite Brother Paul, uh, not the Apostle Paul, but Paul from uh, the West Credit Baptist Church. Uh, and he's going to uh, read God's word to us today. He'll be reading from John chapter 7, uh, verse 1 to 24. So if you have your Bibles, please do get it out. So he'll be reading from John chapter 7, verse 1 to 24. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. So, yeah, John chapter 7, from verse 1 to 24. I'm reading from the ESV translation. <clears throat> Jesus at the Feast of Booths. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, the Jews' Feast of Booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here. And go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. <clears throat> but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was, much, there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man, the others said, no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for the fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. <clears throat> about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. <clears throat> the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. 
Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that reading. And I'm going to invite Brother Dapo to come and bring God's word to us. Uh, let's pray for him as he comes. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your servant. We thank you for your son. We thank you, Lord, that you, you love Dapo, Lord. And I thank you for his time, just opening up your word, studying it to, to bring it to us. Thank you uh, for allow, allowing him to serve us in this way. And I, I just pray, Lord, that you would really allow him to bring out the text, uh, bring out what you have already written in your word uh, in order for us to be encouraged and, and challenged and, and maybe even rebuked, Lord. Uh, so, Lord, I just pray, that, Lord, that you will use your servant this day. Help our hearts to be open. Help us to stay awake and be alert and listen to these words. In your name, amen. amen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all well. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Denzel, for the privilege of standing before the people of God and um, I, I'm never, um, and my wife always reminds me of what a great responsibility it is, and I do not take it lightly. Uh, thank you very much for this. So listen, um, we have a baptismal service today. What a wonderful occasion uh, in the lives of the baptismal candidates. Um, we will continue the story that we have been looking at. Obviously, you all know that we have been looking at the Gospel of John um, over the past uh, few months. We started in January, um, and part of the reason why we wanted to, as a church, uh, look through the Gospel of John is so that we can get a deeper insight into the person, into the personality, into the words of Jesus Christ, into his interactions with uh, the people of Israel, with his disciples, and those that he um, met in his journey. The Gospel of John is quite a different, um, it brings out a different perspective to the other Gospels, um, and it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Uh, one of the things that we will never stop um, encouraging you to do is that even after the service, after what you have heard today, please go home, pick up the Gospel of John, and read it again. Read it as much as you want during the week um, and see what the Holy Spirit will do to your heart. The entrance into the Word gives light, um, and in the Word of God is power for life. Uh, and so we'll always encourage you, please, uh, please to uh, really, really dig into, into the Gospel. So listen, um, we continue the story in John chapter 7. Thank you very much, Paul, for such brilliant uh, reading. Thank you so much. Now, over the past uh, uh, couple of chapters, a number of things had happened to Jesus. Um, he had fed uh, 5,000 men, um, not to count the women um, and the children. Uh, he had fed them with five loaves of bread. Um, but interestingly enough, after he had done that, the Bible tells us that the people wanted to forcibly take him and make him king, right? Forcibly take him and make him king. And guess what Jesus does? Jesus runs away, right? Because he's not about force, he's about conviction. Are you with me? He's not about compulsion, he's about what? Conviction. So when people wanted to take him by force to make him king, they were totally missing it because it was not by force. He wants people to be convinced that he is the Messiah not that people will take him by force. 
and make him king. So the Bible tells us that he actually goes away. He withdrew and he went somewhere else. And after that, he gathers with the disciples and Jesus walks on water. And then over the past couple of weeks, um, we've also been looking at a lot of John chapter 6, where we have the beginning of the I am declarations. I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. And in, uh, in that piece, we also saw that some of Jesus' disciples no longer followed him. They no longer followed him. Why? Because they said, this is a hard teaching. Right? And the challenge we were given from the pulpit at that point in time was that it was only a hard teaching to them because their hearts were hard. Because their hearts were what? Hard. May God help us that our hearts will never be hard in receiving his truth. So some time has passed now, and we come to chapter 7. And we look at the first verse, and it says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. So all the things that had happened were in Judea, and when the Jews wanted to kill him, Jesus goes to the Galilee area. And what I wanted to do was kind of put, give you an indication of the distances we're talking about. So Jerusalem to Galilee is roughly about 150 kilometers. Okay, that's kind of from here to uh, St. Milton Keynes. So probably about three to four days, you know, solid walking, you know? And so the question that came to, to me is that the Son of God, who fed thousands of people, who walked on water, right? Why would he go to such lengths to avoid people simply because they wanted to kill him? Why do you think that is? And the more I thought about it, the more I kind of rested in the fact that Jesus was somebody who was focused on the mission that he came to achieve on the face of the earth and he would not be distracted. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, there is a particular translation, the Living Bible, that says, Jesus cried out in prayer that he would not reach premature death. Jesus was focused on getting to the cross, and he would not let anything distract him from that. So even when there were plots to kill him, he acted in the way that God led him, which was to avoid it. He knew his time. His time to die would come. But before that time would come, it was necessary for him to do the wise thing. So that was kind of where I settled in verse one, in the, in, because of verse 1. You know, that J Jesus did not walk in Judea because people wanted to kill him. And then verse 2 now tells us that the Jewish feast of booths was at hand. Now, the, the feast of booths is also called the feast of tabernacles. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feast that was instituted at the time when the Israelites were in the, uh, in the wilderness. So in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verse 20, 34, the Bible tells us, speak, tells Spoke to, God spoke to Moses and said, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles. And the feast will last how many days? Seven days. My goodness, what a feast. All right, wouldn't we love to have a feast for seven days? Now, this feast of tabernacles um, is actually referred to as Sukkot. I had to go to our resident Jewish speaker uh, in the church to make sure I got that pronunciation right, Sukkot. So everybody say Sukkot. 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 Is that correct, David? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, this festival, this feast, is actually to commemorate the 40 years that the Israelites spent in the wilderness. And so what they were commanded to do was actually to build booths and to live in them. So actually... In modern-day Israel, during this feast, 
you have people who have air-conditioned homes, but during the Feast of Tabernacles, they actually go outside, they actually build booths, right? And they live in those booths for seven days, even though they have air-conditioned homes uh, just around the corner. That is exactly how they celebrate it. So this is a seven-day feast um, that, uh, that was just at hand, a week-long feast. And it's one of the joyful festivals in Judaism, a lot of feasts and a lot of families coming together uh, to celebrate uh, and to remember the years that they spent in the desert li living in tents following their departure from slavery in Egypt. Now the Bible tells us in verse 3 of the text, this is verse 3 or verse 4, that his brothers, Jesus' brothers, interestingly a lot of people don't know this, but Jesus actually had siblings. Who can name Jesus' siblings? You're guessing. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on, guys. Right. Jesus had about four or five brothers, but he also had sisters um, as well. So one of them was James, yes. The other was Hoses. And then there was Judas, not that Judas, right? And then there was Simon. Uh, and he also had sisters, and we see this in Mark chapter 3. Uh, so there is, there is, there is the evidence um, in the scriptures. And I guess, think about it. You know, these guys would have lived with their elder brother for years, right? They would have seen their elder brother become a bit of a sensation in, in Israel. He was arguing with the Sanhedrin. He was feeding 5,000 people. He was healing people. I mean, whose big brother goes around town doing things like this? Um, so these guys were, you know, perhaps wondering in their own minds, who is this chap? Well, yeah, he's our brother, but, you know, surely he, he, he should be going to the feast um, and, and, uh, and um, increasing his popularity. So they encouraged him. They said in verse, um, in verse 3, he says, the, the brother said to him, Depart from here, go into Judea, that your disciples may see the works you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not what? Did not believe him. His brothers did not believe him. They were not even sure who this chap is. They did not believe that he was the Messiah, despite all the years they had spent with him, despite what they had seen with him. They thought, they encouraged him to go to Judea uh, to be part of the celebration, to, the, to be the main figure of the celebration of the feast. They wrongly assumed that works was all Jesus was about. They wrongly assumed that fame was Jesus' objective. Um, but Jesus was not um, about to pander to their platform of unbelief. He was not going to respond to their suggestions because their suggestions came from a platform of what? Unbelief. They did not believe him. So Jesus says to them, you go. My timing is not yet here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. That's what Jesus tells his brothers. So his brothers depart from the feast, but Jesus then does a sneaky thing. Um, after his brothers have gone, um, he goes what? Secretly. Secretly. He goes secretly. He's not out to seek the fame of the people, he goes secretly. Now, I don't know why he goes secretly, um, but he does that. That's what, the Bible tells, that's what the Bible tells us. Now, when he tells his brothers, right, that my time has not yet come, and then he then goes on to say, the world cannot hate you, but they hate me. Even with those words, Jesus was pointing already to the cross. Because when, when his time came, what was the cry of the mob? Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. He knew that when his time was up, the hatred of the world would manifest itself. 
um, in, those, in those terms. So Jesus goes up to the feasts in private. But before that, the Jews were looking for him. So in verse 11, the Bible says, then the Jews sought him at the feast. And they said, where is he? Where is he? Obviously, they were looking for him. They were wondering where he, when he would turn up. And verse 12 says, and there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he's good. And some said, on the contrary, he deceives the people. He deceives the people. Let me spend a few minutes here. Some said he is good. Some said he deceives the people. Those are the only two responses that mankind will give to Jesus Christ. You'll either accept him or you'll reject him. There is no middle ground. There is no abstention. There is no neutral gear. You either accept his person, accept his message, and by that you will repent and turn your back on sin, accept his salvation, and follow him. The only other option is to reject him. The only other option is to decide in your heart that he is a false prophet. If you do not accept him, then the simple fact is that in your mind you have made the decision that he is what? A false prophet. And once you get to that place that he is a false prophet, then all you're doing is rejecting his person you're rejecting his message. You're saying that you will continue your life in sin. And that's the decision that you make. And I say again, there is no middle ground. There is no place for um, a mutual belongation. You can't have one foot in one camp and the other foot in the other camp you are in one of the two. You accept him or you reject him. And that was the position of the Jews. He is good or what? He deceives the people. That's a choice that mankind has ever, always ever faced and that's a choice that every man today faces. So halfway through the feast, Jesus decides to go up to the temple to teach, verse 14. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled. How does this man know letters? How does he know all these things? Having not studied. And Jesus answered them in verse 16 and said, my doctrine is not mine. Let me, again, stop there for a moment. Now, when Jesus went to the temple to teach, I, I just don't think that he stood there and was using fanciful words. I believe he was preaching the message of salvation. But the question I had to ask myself a number of times is, why did the people ask the question that was focusing on Jesus rather than focusing on his message. How is it that they spend time focusing on the person but actually miss the message? Because their words were this, how does this man, how does this man know such things? How does he know these letters, having never studied? 
And here's the danger that each one of us faces in life, in the sense that if we have not settled in our hearts who Jesus is, if we have not settled in our hearts that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, then we will always be at the danger of missing that which he is saying to us. And we will be like people who hear, but do not what? Understand. If we have not settled in our hearts who Jesus is, then we'll stand before him, we'll hear what he's saying, but we will not understand it. And all we'll be asking ourselves is, who is this man talking to me? Who is this man talking to us? And I think that's why it is so critical for us to settle in our hearts who Jesus is. If you're an unbeliever, my plea to you is settle in your heart that Jesus is the Messiah and his words will pierce your heart unto salvation. If you are a believer, settle in your heart that Jesus is the Messiah and that you will continue to follow him all the days of your life so that he may reveal the mysteries of his kingdom to you. The response of the men when they heard Jesus teaching should not have been, who is this guy? Their response should have been what? What must we do to be saved? And when they could not come up with that response, it was clear that the message had not come through to their hearts. And their focus was, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? But Jesus answered them in verse 16. He answers that question. Because he knows that until he answers the question of their hearts, it will prevent them from actually accessing the truth. And Jesus answers their question about how he is able to teach in such manner, teach with such authority. And Jesus generally does that. A lot of people, when he came to Jesus, he would heal them, he would feed them before he gave them the, 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 the message because that was the prime issue in their hearts at that point in time. And Jesus knew that until such hunger, until such curiosity was satisfied, they would not settle to listen to him. And so Jesus answers them in verse 16, and he says, My doctrine is not mine, but is his who sent me. Two important points there. Two very, very important points. Jesus is saying that his teaching is not his, and it belongs to God. But he's also saying what? That he was sent by God. Right? Now, the reason why these two were important then and are important today is because even then, as it is now, right, we, the, the world was plagued with false prophets. False prophets, right? People who came and claimed a lot of stuff and said a lot of stuff, but they were not sent by God. And that was a lot of the problem that Israel had in the days before and when they went to exile in Babylon. A lot of false prophets. And in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 21, God tells Jeremiah that these people have not heard my word, yet they've run. I have, sent, I have not spoken to them, yet they have spoken. And in those two matters, that God raised with Jeremiah were the very two matters that Jesus raised. My words are not mine. They belong to God. And I was sent by him. And again, that's a challenge for each one of us. That we must always believe the words of Jesus Christ and always believe that he is sent of God. 
Jesus was in that verse declaring his authenticity, that he is the Son of God, sent by God with a message of salvation from God. And I guess the one big question that I want to leave everybody with today, the one big question, are you satisfied? Are you convinced? Are you convicted about the authenticity of Jesus Christ? Are you thoroughly convicted about who Jesus is? Not a one-time conviction, not a seasonal conviction, not an up-and-down piece, but a constant, a continuing, a consistent conviction of whom Jesus Christ is. That's the one question I want to leave with you as I bring this to a close. In verses 19 to 24, Jesus decides to challenge the Jews. He challenges them about Moses. So he says here, Did Moses not give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And if you remember, they, were try they wanted to kill Jesus because he healed a lame man on the Sabbath at the pool of Bethesda. Because he healed a lame man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath. That's why they wanted to kill him. So Jesus decides to challenge them. He says, did Moses not give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? And the people answered, you have a demon. Who's trying to kill you? Verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and he's referring to that work, the healing of the man at Bethesda. And you all marvel. And in verse 22, it says, Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man well? On the Sabbath. You see, the Jews had a special relationship with Moses, right? Moses was a hero to them. You talk about the Ten Plagues, you talk about the Ten Commandments, you talk about who spent 40 days off the Mount Sinai in the presence of God. You talk about how God used Moses for so many things. Moses was a special guy to the Israelites. So much so that even the law that God gave them, the law of God, guess what they changed it to? The law of Moses. It was the was law of God, but they changed it to the law of Moses. Right? They, they, Moses was a special guy. Even when, um, when, when, when Moses died, because God told Moses that he would not enter the promised land, but God took him up the mountain, Mount Nebo, so that he could see the promised land, right? And Moses died there. And you know what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 6? God took personal responsibility for burying Moses. And the Bible tells us that till today, nobody knows where Moses is buried. And I've always wondered why. Right? I, I came to the conclusion that if the Israelites, if the Jews had known where Moses had been buried, guess what they would have done? It would have become a shrine. They had a special relationship with him. And so Jesus begins to challenge them in this. And when you read the Gospels, you'll see many, many areas where Jesus challenges them. He will say something like, why then did Moses give you this certificate? Moses said this. Moses said this. Jesus even told his disciples that do not be like the Pharisees because they sit at Moses' seat. They had such a focus on 
Moses. And, God, and so Jesus used that which they held so dear to challenge them. And in reality, what he was doing, what Jesus was doing was that he was calling out their hypocrisy, right? They were happy to circumcise a child on the serb- in the Sabbath so that they could fulfill the, the law of God. But they forgot that all the laws of God could be summarized in two sentences. And do you know what those sentences are? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second one is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. And so he calls out their hypocrisy. He calls out their hypocrisy. And in doing that, Jesus was asking them to shift from a rigid obedience to the law to a life of grace. To a life of grace. Because the Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that grace and truth have come through who? Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. So it's not about a life of legalism. It's not about a life of holiness, superiority. It's a life of what? Grace. 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 Let me end with um, verse 24. Jesus says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Judge with righteous judgment. And so why is Jesus saying this? Do not judge by appearances. So I think that Jesus was telling them, you look at me and you see a carpenter's son. You look at me and you see the son of Joseph and Mary. You look at me and you see the brother to James, to Judas, to Hoses, and the sisters. But Jesus is saying to them, don't judge me by appearances. He says, judge with the righteous what? Judgment. And what I think Jesus was pointing them to and is pointing us to even today Let the signs that he has done be that which points us to him. Let the signs that he has done point to his deity, that he is the Messiah. But above all, Jesus is saying, judge me by the right standard. And what is that standard? That standard is the message of salvation that he preaches. That standard is whom Jesus says that he is. So last week and the week before, we started to look at, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. I am sent by God. And that's what Jesus is asking us, you and I, to make that judgment, to make that judgment on. And that choice is a choice we have to make every day. Is Jesus Christ the Messiah? Are you convicted, are you convinced that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God? And what Jesus is saying, you make that judgment. You make that judgment every day, but also you bear responsibility for that judgment. And in reality, that's what the three candidates that we have today, that is a judgment they have made. And they are here today because they have believed in their hearts that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That Jesus Christ died for them. That he was buried for them and that he was raised for them. And in the last minute or two, let me just make a personal address to the baptismal candidates. 
to Dan, to Gillian, and to Christine. You gave my wife and I the privilege of being entrusted to teach you the little that we know. We sat together for six weeks and we read from the Holy Scriptures. It wasn't just me reading, you read from the Holy Scriptures. We read from different versions so that we could build a good understanding of what the Scriptures were telling us. We did not use philosophy. We did not use motivational speaking. We used the Word of God. You yourself read from the Holy Scriptures. You challenged us with questions. Oh, yes, you did, didn't you? Some of those questions we answered. Some of those questions we didn't have answers for. And all we did was to encourage you to continue in the Word of God and that with time, the Holy Spirit will make the answers known to you. We read from the Holy Scriptures the original plan, God's original plan for mankind. We read how sin interrupted that plan, how the sinful nature seeks to destroy everything that God seeks to do. But we also read God's salvation plan, the blood of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection. We spent time studying what happened on Calvary's cross and that the sinful nature has been crucified so that we are no longer slaves to sin. We looked at the difference between the old life and the new life. We looked at the fact that because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, we are adopted into his household. We looked at the privileges of adoption, the privilege of intimacy, the privilege of identity, the privilege of inheritance. And one of you shared your own personal testimony in that regard. We spent an evening talking about the essential need for the discipleship of our lives so that we continue in the word of God and continue in the faith. So as you get baptized today, I want to leave you with three points. Three points, please. One, be solid in your conviction of whom Jesus Christ is. In the person of Jesus, in the authenticity of Jesus Christ, be solid in that. No matter what you face, be solid in that. Number two, be unshakable in your conviction of what Jesus Christ has achieved on the cross of Calvary. Because that is what has changed the course of mankind in those who will believe him forever. Be unshakable in your conviction of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. You were crucified with him, you were buried with him, and you have been raised into a new life. And lastly, I end with this. Be focused on the person of Jesus Christ for the discipleship of your lives so that you'll get to know him and that by the mercy and by the Spirit of God, you'll be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Dapper, for, for bringing us God's word, for bringing, really bringing out the text and, and showing us who Jesus is. What a beauty it is that we can come and be reminded of who Jesus is. So, so God bless you. Um, we're going to go and get ready to get changed for baptism. And so I'm going to invite the worship team to come and sing a song for us, please. Us? 
No, I'm joking. All right, see you soon. Thank you so much, church, for, for bearing with us. Uh, God bless you. Uh, before we go, I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, is there anyone here for the very first time? Can you just uh, wave at me? Uh, we just want to give you a gift uh, just to welcome you to our church. If you're here for the first time, don't be shy. Just wave at me. Good to see you, sister. Good to see you. Good to see you. I see you. Oh, I see you. Um, we have a little gift uh, to give you. And in that gift, there is a £10 voucher to our amazing bookstore. Uh, so if you are free after the service, uh, please do come and, and get whatever book you want out of the value of £10. And our brothers and sisters, uh, I pray that you enjoy your week. But most importantly, I pray that you have a deep focus on Christ and what he's done for you. If you're here today and you felt moved and you would like to be baptized, uh, please do come and speak to, to me or speak to Dapo and, and we'll steer you in the right direction. But church, time is gone, so let's stand together and let's share the benediction. You don't have to rush off, of course. We have teas and coffee at the end of the service. Let's, let's fellowship with one another and 100% encourage uh, those who are baptized today. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be of us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Be gracious to you.